start, uh, Renzo, with you. And this is more of a very specific question to you uh, after your presentation, because you really took us through an entire sound journey, uh, one for all of the senses. I think we all really uh, enjoyed that. Uh, where do you see the role of innovation also in, in senses and, and in art in the auto industry? Because we are in this panel uh, talking about how mobility players, existing mobility players, can continue to move forward and innovate. Mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of potential and we are already working on this in different fields because sound is just one of our senses. Um, that's why we define mostly and we talk mostly about experiences. For instance, in my department, I, I, I work together with um, a scent design. Uh, we, and uh, in one of the last projects, I literally translated the particles of scent into sound. And uh, we work together in a team where we also have light desi designers, of course, material designers. So we define the experiences. And ultimately, it's, it's about the space and the condition where we want the people to be mm. or where the people wishes to be. And we have to create this framework um, based on how we compose the senses together. And I think for the mobility of tomorrow, uh, considering that cars, if we're speaking about cars now, um, will define an environment, uh, environment also with the auto automotive, uh, um, yeah, automotive uh, drive, driving, uh, self-assisted driving, uh, we are going to design the space where they will, you know, um, experience something different. Just to follow up on that, if we're moving in, in the future towards an environment in terms of mobility where there's more sharing, right? So more connectivity and sharing, and some of what you're designing is also about an individual uh, experience, how does that fit together? So the, yeah, one of the, the vision actually it's, uh, of mine is to have, a, in terms of music and sound, is to have an intelligent composer, someone that actually sees you understand who you are and potentially what, what are, do you need. So it's individual in the sense that it fits your need, but not all yours, the ones that everyone has, because everyone is defined based on our emotional DNA about what we could express potentially. And this, in terms of artificial intelligence, the car is gonna be uh, an empathy machine, I would say something that it feels to you and then it's uh, ready to respond to you. An empathy machine, I like that. Thomas, if we can come to you now. We heard Jan Toschka talking about this and you as well in your presentation. You know, it, it is a bit of a difficult, difficult balance to strike, isn't it? On the one hand, we're preparing for this future that might look very different. But in the meantime, in the short to middle term, we also have to keep some of the existing infrastructure and mobility solutions. How, how do you deal with that, that balance? Yeah, that's, uh, it's a bit like uh, what also the, uh, Shell has said, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in the media we get completely hyped, and I said the development is so fast, and it is, actually. But the reality is that we're living on a world that we need to move with, actually. And uh, how we bring the balance together, I think Bridgestone, in that sense, has done it really well. We have done it really well, bringing kind of a startup culture, and the company was not a startup anymore because it was market leader in that segment already in Europe, bring it together, a digital-driven mindset with the mindset of an industry production maker. And I think a lot of companies, even outside of the mobility space, have their challenges. I mean, we, you spoke also before about this, this mental challenges that comes with this change process. I mean, change management isn't easy, and humans adapting usually slower to that change than technology is involving. Uh, I, I mentioned a couple of times this amazing technology that drives us all, that has changed the culture. I mean, hmm. the, uh, the gentleman from, uh, from UPS mentioned the smartphones. It's just 11, 12 years ago that they were invented, actually, and, and brought to the market. That's just a decade. It doesn't feel like this is a decade. And if you think about that our mans flew to the moon with a computing capacity that was a couple of thousand times less that we all have in our pockets, it's just unimaginable. Yeah. And, and I find it really interesting to see that now the cars might become emotionally bodies to us. And I, I, I just don't know, but actually I know that we don't know, and then we should make that happen, and we should be open-minded and not 
so concerned as sometimes I have to say the Germans are. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be open to that, certainly. Uh, Felix, uh, I want to come to you now because I think we have a photo that we've prepared that I, I wanted to, to put up here on the screen and uh, as we're getting that up. There it is. Oh, no. <laughs> I have to, I'm sorry to put you on the spot here, Felix, but you, ta you talked about space <laughs> and public space in cities. And this photo is from our wonderful curator, Joran, who took this at Berlin Alexanderplatz. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you about where the role of the scooter comes in in terms of taking up public space. Because as we see on the, uh, in this image, it, it has also been somewhat controversial in a city like Berlin. How do we make sure that it doesn't take up too much space? Um, well, it doesn't. Um, one, <laughs> one, one scooter, uh, 10 scooters take up the space of, of one car that's parked um, um, 23 hours per day, okay. where our scooters get used any, anything between one or five or 10 times even now, like in the UK, um, uh, 10 times per day. So um, the question is not so much, um, is there enough, on s s uh, enough uh, space on the sidewalk? The question is how quickly are cities Mm -hmm. um, redesigning themselves to accommodate new modes of transport. Mm. Right? We have still a lot of uh, bike and cycle lanes from the 70s, and they're not really usable, to be honest. So now, um, what was incredibly incredible for me to see with COVID, um, one thing we've learned, I mean, there's a lot of changes, uh, e-learning, e-working, but one of the things we've learned was that it's not possible, or we can't do it that fast, is not true. We can do things really fast. And we've seen these pop-up bike lanes here. We've seen Brussels, as a reaction to COVID, just shut down the city, put all, um, all um, 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 traffic lights to blinking, yeah. and basically giving cyclists and pedestrians the right of way before cars and the general speed limit of 20 kilometers for cars. It's, it makes absolutely no sense to use cars in cities. So what I'm asking, I mean, this, this is a... This is a is unfortunate. It's part of the, the, the kickstand, honestly. <laughs> First generation MVP. It's, and it's, it's a competitor. It's a competitor, of course. <laughs> right. you sorry, never, sorry you about never that. See, you never see scooter uh, spin now. scooters like that. But yeah, of course. I mean, this is the first generation of products. Um, and what I showed earlier in my presentation is this is just the beginning of a almost like a Cumbrian explosion of micro mobility vehicles. So you have three, three wheels, to, uh, four wheels. You have electric cargo bikes. You have vehicles with roof, without roof. This is just one. Um, sort of most simple um, first product um, of micromobility. Mm -hmm. And in the long term, it's clear that this makes more sense than cars and cities. So we need to start redesigning those cities. We need to claim the space that they don't have to stand on, um, on, on pavements, that cities will provide infrastructure like they have done for bikes. I mean, bikes, um, you, you could walk through Berlin and you could, if you've never seen bikes before, you could see like, wow, this is a lot of bikes. They're really you know, taking up space on the sidewalks. But they're locked to bicycle racks and we're building more and more bicycle racks, so we need to also provide the infrastructure for, for, for these kind of things. And it is possible. And it's not about consumer choice and not just about innovation and things happening like what can we invent that is even better and greater for people to buy. This is a city planning choice. This, mm -hmm. is, this is something where it's not just up to the industry, but it's actually up to cities to make political decisions and say this is what we want. And we see it in Paris, we see it in Brussels, we see it in Lisbon. Um, and in, in Germany, because of the federal structure or um, other reasons, um, we are even more, we are a bit more careful than in other cities. But this is happening quickly right now. Just to follow up on that, what would you suggest? Do we need a, a pop-up lane for scooters? I mean, what would be the right infrastructure to adapt? So we need micromobility lanes, right? This, this artificial competition between bikes and scooters is... Is, 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 a, is a no topic in my, in my opinion. If you have a, a, a physical, physically protected infrastructure on the road where you just take away the lane where now cars are parking or you take away one of the two lanes where cars are driving and you make that a dedicated micro-mobility lane, so for bicycles, for you know, slightly larger vehicles with a roof, um, uh, four wheels or big cargo bikes, then there is enough space. There's absolutely enough space. Um, just right now, it's all taken up by cars. So, um, yes, these small 70s, almost cobblestone-ish cycle lanes, they won't cut it in the future. And frankly, even with a bike, you don't really want to use it. So it, it really needs dedicated infrastructure and protected infrastructure. 
Kareem, you are our safety man here on the panel. So <laughs> how are you going to, how, how do you look at this picture and think about the situation of adapting to micromobility, the, the different types of micromobility that right. Felix was just talking about? Well, first of all, let me straighten one thing out. I'm a big fan of uh, micromobility yeah. myself on a personal use. I used first time a scooter, uh, I think in summer 2018 in, in Los Angeles. Mm. Um, I think we were all overwhelmed by the speed of this movement coming to Europe. Um, it was kind of almost like an app-based speed, like we know it, it's certainly in the App Store, al although that this has a hardware component. And I think this is also then we need to adapt a bit, of course, the, the ecosystems towards these kind of new mobilities in cities. And I would say our, expo our experience as DECRA is that um, cities were not ready for this. So we have quite clear regulation for cars, where to park, how to behave in the street, whatever, how you do. It, with the scooter, it was like, okay, here's a scooter, uh, there's allowance to drive it when you have a certain age and then you go. And so we did not really take care of any user behavior and so now to put this all on the scooter company is also not fair. Mm. Obviously they play their part because we do uh, also do analysis of the accidents that are um, uh, been uh, that, that that take care and um, the, uh, that happen and there's a lot of uh, severe accidents and and uh, because the scooters were also at the beginning in this first levels not at an quality stage that they are usable for industrial um, use which having uh, three four six people using it every day and I think there we need to work all together taking the municipalities taking the scooter companies the producers I saw Okai here just uh, outside side, um, getting them all together, regulation on top and uh, a company like ourselves being a neutral partner in this because we just want to make it happen so we don't have other uh, inflicting interests in it. But we need to take care that it's not increasing the level of, of uh, accidents. Mm -hmm. And the same is actually true for e-bikes. So we speak a lot about scooters, we don't speak about e-bikes and the, the risen accident rate there uh, because so many people suddenly have a, have, a, have a bike that they can be driving way faster than they should be mm -hmm. uh, because it's simply accelerating by itself. So I think just in November we're going to bring out a new report. We usually have a safety accident report. I'm um, also talking to the politicians here in, in Berlin about it. And I think we, we, we put clear recommendations of what we should do instead of um, kind of keeping it to itself and just every city dealing with a provider in order to how to make it happen. And I think then it will be nice and a and, and nice addition to city transportation. Just quickly to follow up on that, does, is regulation and, and the role of politics uh, dragging things behind a little bit? Is that something that is a, is a struggle in, in trying to adapt to changes? Uh, my eyes certainly yes. Yeah. If you just uh, also look, first look, look across different countries. So we have different regulations country by country, mm -hmm. and we don't have too many regulations in my eyes, which also go into the user behavior and also way how and, and, and structuring infrastructure in, in cities. I think it's left to the cities and left to each uh, and every every mayor in, in that sense. And I think the um, the scooter companies do a great job and already accompany and kind of taking experiences from one city to another. Mm -hmm. But this needs a bit a bigger consultation action than just uh, this this bit by bit by bit can I can I yeah add please to that? sorry um, and and actually um, the cities are getting a lot better around that so especially the situation in Germany was really it was allowed from one day to another and cities weren't ready for it right yeah the the tenders we're seeing now happening in in other countries um, the thing the, the tenders that happened in Paris and Lyon and uh, in what's happening in the UK already reflects a lot of these learnings and um, the scooter company actually em embrace that regulation because it's, it's, it's safer and better and it's more sustainable in the long term. So it's not, it's a, it's not the situation where, where the scooter companies try to, um, try to avoid regulation, but it's actually quite the opposite. So in Germany, we are actively pushing cities to regulate more mm -hmm. and to create more rules. Um, but you have to create this infrastructure for it to be safe. I mean, when, when cars first came out, they were the da most dangerous thing ever invented. <laughs> kids were yeah. dying on the streets. It was insane. I mean, people forget that, right? Yeah. Like, basically, kids were playing on the street. All of a sudden, there were cars. So <laughs> the whole city was redesigned to make this incredibly, incredibly dangerous, incredibly powerful machines safe. I mean, that's why uh, jaywalking was invented. That's why traffic lights were invented. That was all invented to make it safe. So I think in comparison, the things we need to make scooters safe is, is, is really not that, uh, n not even comparable. I mean, we know what to do and we just need to move towards it. But of course, uh, this doesn't go overnight and it's a new phenomenon and it, it basically hit the, the streets very, very quickly, so. Yeah. I have a, yeah. I have a question actually for you, if I may. Um, 
I I also use a lot the the e scooter in, in the city and um, I am big fan of it. But your presentation made me think a lot about uh, the idea of occupying space. And actually, the picture um, actually says it all because all of a sudden the pedestrian ways have been occupied more and more by scooters. And um, you're saying the city have to solve the problem. Uh, they have to find out a solution. But I'm wondering if on the side of the producer, you have also some propositions for the solution uh, for the city. Because actually, you are injecting uh, more entities that were not um, you know, expect it. Mm -hmm. And um, so do you have some, some kind of proposition in terms of stations or uh, a side of the, 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 the streets, if there is something in the dynamics on how the things are placed that can, be, can help cities to find a solution? Absolutely. So, I mean, we, we actually have uh, spin hubs, which we've um, been the only, the only operator really deploying in, in, in a major way. So especially in smaller towns, college campuses in the US, mm -hmm. we have a, a number of markets where we have these spin hubs, which serve as um, parking spots, but also charge the scooter. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, the answer is yes. Um, but of course, still, they need to be put somewhere. So we're working with, with real estate development companies. We're working with private partners to put these, these hubs. Um, but of course, um, it is in the interest of the city to provide that space. So basically taking a parking space and saying, here, you can put a hub. So that plan needs to come together, um, together with the city. Um, and yeah, I mean, there is, there is, there's clearly solutions to, to do this properly. Hmm. I think uh, there was the call of, of more regulation, and the regulator should fix that. I'm, I'm a little bit of a different opinion. This is, a, this is a job of the society, of the community. And I lived 11 years in Amsterdam until last year, actually, myself, and uh, a couple of pictures there. And uh, of course, you don't see so many cars there. Why is that? Because the mindset is different. The mindset is different uh, of micro-mobility, not with e-scooters, but with cycle bicycles. We have bicycle parking slots and halls. Everybody knows that it was already there. The mindset is there. And why we have actually so a low adaptation rate of electric cars in Germany, and why we have a much higher adaptation rates in the Nordics and in, uh, in the Netherlands specifically. I think in the Netherlands driving at the moment the most, I don't say the name, but the <laughs> Tesla's around, uh, everywhere there, because the mindset is more ecological driven. I think we should lobby a little bit more than the society takes this forward and understands that. Uh, if, we, if we want to regulate something, then you regulate something for, but you regulate also something against something. Mm. And, and we have probably a dilemma in Germany of being a very strong car producer company, uh, uh, country where we have the lobbies playing around each other. And we should find to a duopoly or, or, or multiple opinions that, that, that actually start, start to understanding that the city cannot be changed in five years or 10 years, because you said it's built in the 70s, maybe even longer roads in a, in a city. Uh, we, we should work together in, in, in a more yeah, lobbying way. I, I, I find it not really cool. And what you can do is, of course, and it was also said before, you can gradually change the incentives. Either, somebody says a stick, I think it was you, uh, increasing parking fees. A lot of people will hate me probably for that. <laughs> but I've paid amazingly parking fees in Amsterdam, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is, this prevents you to go with a car into the city for a, for a shopping experience. You take the public transport or you take your bicycles because the, the amounts of, of parking costs you pay, the same thing has happened in Sydney. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. They limit the car traffic into cities. And I think Amsterdam will be one of the first cities in line with Barcelona that take this far more serious, actually, these changes. Uh, we have also business there. And, and you see how that goes, actually. It goes hand in hand. It's not kind of you make a law or a regulation and we ban one medium of transport against the other. That doesn't work, actually, from my point of view. But how do you communicate effectively? This is something we talked about yesterday. You know, we're talking about the difference between carrots and sticks and which is more effective. How do you communicate effectively so that it doesn't become so politically divisive uh, if, you, if you start to charge more for parking spaces, for example, in a city and people here in Berlin get more frustrated? I mean, what is the right way to strike that balance? Mm -hmm. Anybody can answer that, but the thing is that um, you know every one of us has different needs, and mm -hmm. um, cars are there because because people need cars. 
they buy them, they pay lots of money for cards. It's not that they are giving them for free and they go around with cards. And, and so it's uh, also lots about self-discipline, what you're saying is right, like a change in the mindset and understanding that maybe out of 10 times, um, five of them I can, I can avoid to use the car for, for going to the city and doing shopping. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's a, not only subliminal communication, it has to be a conscious communication, uh, a way of, of sharing um, what are the, you know, the pros and, and contras for, for a decision, mm -hmm. to, be, to make people aware of the implication of an action. Driving a city in a car has some implications. Do I need it? Yes. So then I'll do it and I will face also the consequences, maybe paying um, more for, for a parking ticket or uh, having to drive around for, for three hours to find, for, for find the parking place because <laughs> it's limited. These are consequences. And if I'm aware of this and if I have given other solutions like, like, such as immobility, micromobility, or public transportation and so on, I will be free to, to decide and to, and to make a conscious decision. I'm, I'm fully agree. That is exactly the right way to do it. It's not by hardcore regulation that you cannot go in the city on a Monday or on a Tuesday. That is very harsh because some people need to go there yeah. and then they need to pay. But actually money is a very strong incentivization actually. And you can regulate this. You can have a, a bit more conscious decision for what you spend money as you go with your family in a, in, a, in a nice holiday or you travel every day in and out with your car when it becomes more expensive. Of course, you cannot limit everybody and especially transport and commercial transport for cities is absolutely necessary because we said more and more people live in urban areas. And then actually, we need to bring service into the cities, we need to be food into cities and so on. So my vision actually of a smart city in the future is kind of an airport. I mean, airport is now not for the CO2 emission the leading example, but how it's organized. Okay. It's a very complex system where, where trucks, delivery, vans, buses, passengers, gets all fine graded, steered, uh, getting slots, landing slots, but also trucks have landing slots to deliver products. And in this way, you can actually avoid jams hmm. that not the craftsman can go at any time in any place, but get a kind of a slot when you can go in. And that can be done by technology, actually. So my view is we will have see more personal, individual micromobility, as you call it, and the business, the commercial delivery of goods, products, energy, services will be more data-driven, automated or regula regulated is a, is a wrong word in this, in this context. Uh, they will be supported by automation, actually. I do agree uh, specifically with the point that we need a bigger picture on, on, on specifically also city planning. We do have great examples like Amsterdam or Copenhagen, where we had great uh, visionaries of how to lay out a city, how to organize um, more bike lanes, kind of really uh, infrastructure rebuilding. And I think this is something that we need to, to tackle on. And I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of different players, different uh, entities uh, sticking their hats together. And probably you have you've seen the example of the Woven City, some an initiative that's been started by Toyota just in, in Asia on how they, the, the future city layouts might be in an idealistic way and use those visionary images, and if we agree in parts, and see how we can maybe translate our existing cities towards it. But of course, to change a medieval city like I'm um, coming from Bamberg, in, in Franconia, change a medieval city with, uh, I don't know even what, what uh, um, Kopfsteinpflaster means in, in English. Yeah. Well, you, know, yeah. you know how they uh, did to it. To change that towards a model that is the ideal woven city of Toyota is, is, is yeah. uh, quite, long, quite a leap. Well, you know how they did it like at the turn of the, the 19th century, right? If you had Schinke or, or Hausmann or, or these kind of, you know, basically the, the imperial um, uh, cities, they, they basically tore the, the, the medieval stuff down and just put the big boulevards. <laughs> yeah, um, and great of course, idea. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not promoting that, but there was, to your point, a real vision, right? It's like, okay, um, there's industrialization, and for cities to adopt to industrialization, we need to radically change them. Right. And if that means tearing down whole quarters and rebuilding them, then so be it. I also want the big street for the parade, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have a similar profound change driven by technology and also driven by necessity, uh, climate change and, and, and running out of space in cities. So we need to come up with, we, we need to have a clearly stated vision. And that's, I think, so it doesn't become confrontative. I think it's clear, it's, uh, cities need to have a very clear, clearly stated and painted picture of this is where we want to go and this is where, where it should go, right? Mm. Then you have a second aspect where um, it's not about punishing um, cars, but right now 
people that don't drive cars and take the public transport or don't own a car actually subsidize a lot of it. So at least we need to get back to a point where it's fair, where the person without a car doesn't pay for the, for the subsidized parking in, in, in public land. And, and then the third is, is creating that infrastructure because it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, in, in the Netherlands, I think first the infrastructure was there and then people really started driving a lot more um, on, uh, w with bikes. I moved to Lisbon five years ago and there was no bikes whatsoever. And coming from Berlin, they had some new psychopaths in Lisbon. So when, when I stepped on it, you know, I was basically always looking left, right, never, never a bicycle, never. <laughs> and then, you know, at some point I started not looking anymore, but I kind of braced for impact because when you step on a cycle lane here in Berlin, you surely get hit, right? Um, now it, it reversed. So now that they built 200 kilometers of cycle lanes, you do start seeing a lot of bikes. So now, I have to look again because there's actually bicycles. So that was really just purely. And when you talk to people, they just said like, oh, now that I have, now that I can go on a cycle path all the way to the university or to my job, um, and I live along this cycle route, I will totally use it before I would have never went you know, on the streets because it's, it's, it's way too dangerous. So change can happen pretty quickly in a place like that? I, I think it can happen quickly. I mean, we've, we're seeing this now, and when we say it can't happen in five to ten years, I think it can. I mean, um, there's always this discussion in Germany from like local businesses, when you close down streets like the Friedrichstraße, oh, but then where are my customers going to park? I'm going to have less business. <laughs> the reality, it's always the other way around. A couple of months later, they're like, wow, I have actually more business, because foot traffic is what brings you business. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, we spoke about this dilemma of our infrastructure. Was, was, was said multiple times, infrastructure needs to be first, then the demand right. comes and so on. I think it's a duopoly anyway, it's just, uh, but you're right. Uh, infrastructure matters. But to change cities will take long. So how we could change that all? We, we know there is a lot of money flying between the states, in the different countries, to the, to the cities and so on. So you could actually make that depending on the kilometers of bike roads that a city has. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, you incentivize the local people that make decisions about the infrastructure in the town, how much money they get subsidized or not subsidized, how tax money is actually used in this country or in other countries of the world to actually make a move if there is willingness. So we assume there is willingness from the government to make that changes to getting a green, greener uh, society. So that could be the tax flow used in a way that cities that make progress to re-architecture their cities in a more progressive way than the others have more benefits. And then you get a self-enforcing spiral. Because if cities make that progress and they get greener and they get, they get more living, uh, the living is more nicer because you have uh, not so much pollution, then other cities will do that as well and so on and so on. So that's the thing, the same thing what we said, incentivation, it doesn't need to be only on a personalized way what hits you hard with the parking fees, I know that's a very hot topic, but, uh, but actually you can also gradually introduce this by the CO2 uh, costs that actually everybody cares on. I found it's very modest actually, how we as consumers get influenced by CO2. I mean, if I talk to friends, I, they're not clear what they actually uh, how much CO2 the emission, and, and the willingness is not yet there, but if there is a more public talk, what it really costs and how you, what price you pay for, uh, then maybe the change is coming more actively. I think mm -hmm. we all living with so many influences in a very complex and fast-changing world, and we need, from my point of view, also a bit of guidance and make this more obvious, will people change? They make, they, they, they make that people change. They are not against that. They are not 100% clear, I believe because you said how we should communicate. I think by this kind of ways, you can make that more, um, at least a faster circle and spir spiral. Hmm. Because our time will be running out in a little bit, maybe I can ask one last question that, that we can go around and answer. Um, you know, when we look at future mobility solutions, it's, it's more and more about um, taking an interdisciplinary approach, really work, networking, exchanging, uh, working between the public and private sectors. And I'm curious how that informs all of the work that you're doing. So. Renzo, maybe we can start with you. Um, you said interdisciplinary, yes, right? Yes, yes. I, th I think this is key and it is essential for driving a change 
in a direction that it's not uh, expected. And I think I am an, an example for this, coming from, from maybe a, a different area, dis a different discipline, and then landing into the automotive industry, which is something that it was not in my perspective. Mm -hmm. I was doing something completely uh, um, different. But um, I'm happy that uh, the company embraced the challenge because I, uh, from my perspective, I challenged uh, lots of the processes, lots, lots of the things they were looking at the way they were looking at. And um, what, what I've learned is that if you are open to look at things from a different perspective, at least being open, it's already a step forward. And then uh, the aspect of interdisciplinary, you know, I, I come from a country, I'm Italian, uh, where uh, Leonardo was there, and Leonardo was painting the Mona Lisa and conceiving the helic helicopters of right. tomorrow. And there is no uh, border between art between um, the expression of, of human soul and the con conception of technology. And I think this is something that has to be integrated more and more in all the company, mostly in, in the technological world. I think there are some of them that are going in this way, but I can tell you if you bring an artist on board, if you, if you bring something creative and let him look at the technology, mm. you can have surprises, you can have things that you wouldn't have thought earlier and I'm just uh, fostering and I I hope that is going to happen more and more. Yeah. Thomas, a web fleet is also... I, I completely agree. Open mindset is yeah. a precondition uh, for every change, for every transformation, for every reinvention, what we said. Uh, it is hard, but push you above your own limits. Push, push your, uh, above your own imagination because change will happen. And the only thing what we cannot predict is what it will change. But we need to be open-minded. The people that want to stay and want to, to claim technology, products, arts, whatever they have, they are feel in the comfort zone. And that's, that's another human aspect. If you stay in the comfort zone, you don't want to move out. But these changes in the world, driven by technology, by wellness, by ecolog ecological challenges, they will move us out of our comfort zone. And, and the, the advice from a business, from a large business like Bridgestone, from a small startup, is always push you above your own imagination and then make it happen. I also very much believe in, in open innovation. We're really living in a Decra Digital. And um, we just uh, two weeks ago, we announced that we will be forming a new partnership with um, High Race, where we're forming a new uh, motorsport uh, engagement together with um, Hans-Werner Aufrecht, the founder of AMG, who actually really knows how to build nice cars, together with um, Scheffler and ADAC. So we're trying to showcase new technology and do that in, an, in a coordinated manner. We, we, you know that we have the test center here in Kletwitz, very close, which we also offer to, to, um, uh, offer to um, startups that they can use mm -hmm. it. So I really I think it is always taking br um, bright minds and willing, uh, um, uh, willing adventurers together, and then you can create new. Felix. Well, you, you mentioned um, public and, and private yeah. and, and, <laughs> and how, how it all comes together. And I think what's so super fascinating for me about new mobility, shared mobility, and you know, um, scooters being just one, one aspect of it is that 10 years ago it would have not have been possible, right? Um, without the platform in our pockets, the smartphone, without IoT, um, a lot of these, these models wouldn't be possible. And I think just how you had a first industrial revolution, a second industrial revolution, we're just basically, this is the first, the change we see in our cities and the change in mobility is, is the first sign of the second digital revolution where the stuff we've created online, the cloud, you know, AI, cloud computing, cloud storage, um, social networking, um, all these things that first were completely virtual. And I mean, I've built two companies in the virtual space. I mean, it was really all about apps and I never really wanted to have anything to do with, you know, something that is physical because it just makes things messy, right? <laughs> um, and now we see how all of this technology is being applied in record pace to the physical world. And I find that incredibly fascinating. Um, it, you wouldn't have been able to navigate a city like London with public transport 10 years ago because you would have been an expert and someone who lived there for years and years to understand the, the bus system. Now you take out Google Maps, right? Um, you see a scooter standing on the street that 
I don't know, 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been possible. You would have had a store where you, you, know, you sign all up and you, you give your driver's license and all this stuff, and now it's just beep, beep, you know, basically with Apple Pay or with scanning a barcode. And, and that makes all these things possible. So I think we're only on the beginning how this all impacts the way we live much more profoundly than maybe the smartphone has. Mm. Um, and that's, we don't, yeah, I mean, we, we're not good exponential thinkers, so it's hard for us to even imagine where this will lead. But I think it's an insanely um, interesting time to live in. It really is. That's a great point to close on. Renzo, Thomas, Karim, and Felix, thank you very much for that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.